uh, this will be the third class we've had. Let's review a little bit from the last few weeks before we take our uh, uh, weekly quiz. This time we not only have craisins, we have white grapes, uh, dehydrated, shriveled, raisins, whatever you call them. Uh, there are four great questions that people try to answer and all religions try to answer. Who can name any of those questions? Who am I? Who am I? Another one. Where am I going? Where did I come from? Where did I come from? There we go. And where am I going when I die? There you go. Who else got one back there? Did he get one? Okay. Oh. So those are four great questions. Every, every religion tries to answer those. Um, the three lies that Satan told to Eve, who can name any of those? Deny God's word and then what? Well, Doubt, cause doubts about God's word and deify mankind. Was that Steve? Got that one? All right, there we go. Let's see. Uh, how many times in Ezekiel did Lucifer say, I will? Five times. Man, this guy's on the ball. You like raisins? He didn't have supper or something or what? Okay. Let's see, that'll be for tonight. Then last week we talked about uh, the quiz, the different types of, we covered for the quiz tonight, uh, the different meanings of the word evolution. I had a debate uh, a couple days, yesterday, where was I? Arkansas, uh, Little Rock, Arkansas, and I debated a professor up there. I've learned that if, I have two more debates coming up scheduled. If you start off defining what you mean by the word evolution, the argument's basically over because there are six different meanings to the word, and this is something we'll be quizzed on tonight. Cosmic evolution, that would be the origin of time, space, and matter, i.e., the Big Bang. They have no evidence for this at all, but they believe it happened. After that, the Big Bang supposedly produced hydrogen, which then you'd have to have billions of years of chemical evolution. Now, what I'm doing now in my timeline, on here, I start off not only with my 20 billion year timeline, I add cosmic evolution would be here, and then you'd have chemical evolution somewhere in here. After that, you'd have to have stellar and planetary evolution. The stars and planets would have to form. Nobody's ever seen that happen, but they believe that it did. And then you finally get to number four, which is organic evolution. Now you have to get the origin of life. Life has to get started from non-living material. Most textbooks, it's hilarious to watch, they'll spend a whole chapter talking about Francisco Reddy and Louis Pasteur saying how life cannot come from non-living material. Then the next chapter, it says, however, we believe life came from non-living material. <laughs> I just say, don't you see what you just did? Organic evolution would have to be here. Then you'd have to have macroevolution, which is changes between different kinds of animals. And finally, you get to microevolution. Now, that one is scientific. The rest of them are pure religion. They just don't happen. And they're always arguing about, where's the border between micro and macro? I say, well, I don't know, and that's a good field of study. We ought to be working on that. However, that doesn't prove the other five are part of evolution. I, I now use the term, I say they smuggled these other ones in when nobody was looking. They smuggle in micro. Uh, Microevolution is a fact, but they smuggle in the rest of them as if it is part of science, and it's certainly not. Okay, we also talked about, in 1933, a very famous document was written called the Humanist Manifesto. One of the signers of the Humanist Manifesto was a fellow named John Dewey. John Dewey had one of the most, uh, was one of the most influential people in the world, at least in America, when it comes to public education. Uh, John Dewey, a humanist, and he went to Vermont to the Teachers College and just led a... Uh, a secret quiet revolution, so to speak, in training teachers who later became principals and deans at colleges. And basically our education system was taken over by the humanist philosophy, largely because of the results of work of a guy named John Dewey. Uh, there's a Latin phrase that means uh, single spoken sentence. What is that Latin phrase? Universe. universe, right, interesting. The evolutionists are always talking about the universe. Say, do you know what that means? Single spoken sentence. God said, let there be. Well, who remembers last week some of the problems with the Big Bang Theory? What does, what does it not explain? doesn't explain where the matter came from. What else? Where did the energy come from? Where the laws come from? Uh, why do we have clumps of matter called galaxies and zillions of miles of nothing in between? I mean, if the Big Bang Theory were true, matter should be evenly distributed. And it's not. And? Retrograde motion. Everything's not spinning the same direction. Those are some of the problems with the Big Bang Theory. Okay, any questions? Also, we covered the word thermodynamics. Who remembers what that means? 
heat for thermo, thermometer, and dynamics for power. Dynamite means heat power. And there are basically two laws of thermodynamics. One says things can't create themselves. Second one says everything's falling apart. We don't see anything improving. Somehow they think if you just add energy, things will improve. Well, the sun adds energy all the time to the earth, but it doesn't improve anything. It destroys everything, except one thing is able to use the sun's energy, chlorophyll. If it weren't for that, the sun would destroy everything on earth. You can't use the sunlight. You can't turn it into energy. Only chlorophyll in plants can do that. All right. This week, we're going to talk about uh, what can the public schools teach about creation? There's an awful lot of misinformation going around out there. I get faxes and emails and letters all the time, especially about what, after what happened in Kansas. How many heard about that when Kansas said, uh, you're not gonna, we're not going to require macro evolution to be taught? Boy, the evolutionists came unglued. There's articles in the paper, letters to the editor. CNN has a whole section on their website about uh, how Kansas is going to go back to the dark ages now. Uh, <laughs> very interesting. Let me explain what the truth is and what the law is about this. As far as anybody can figure out, there are only two options. Somebody created the world or the world created itself. Now, there are some who say, well, no, the world's always been here. Now, hold it. That violates the first and second laws of thermodynamics. One guy wrote me an email last week and he said, don't you think God could have created a universe that was always here? <laughs> I said, think about what you're saying. <laughs> if he created it, it wasn't always here. You have a contradiction of terms here. Sure, God can do what he wants, but the laws tell us the universe could not have always existed. It is winding down, so there had to be a beginning. So basically, the only two reasonable options are somebody made it or it made itself. Evolution. Now, what should the schools teach? I get asked this question very frequently. Do you think we should teach creation in public schools? And I think it's a good question, and that's what we're going to discuss tonight. However... There's another question we should ask first. Should we have public schools? Boy, they come unglued when you even ask that question. <laughs> but that really is a valid question. What right does the government have to get involved in educating your children? That goes off onto a long rabbit trail we could chase. We will forego that tonight about the straw man that they create. We've got a videotape on that. You can call our office about the straw man. That explains all that topic if you'd like. But... Uh, Assuming we cannot sh stop the public school system by tomorrow, what should they teach in the public schools? Well, for one, the schools should teach the truth. They should teach science. If it's a science class, you teach science. What do we know? You can teach biology. Okay, kid, this is the biceps. This is the triceps. These are the extenders. These are the flexors, the radius, the ulna, the humerus, the deltoid. You can teach all the muscles. And then when they say, well, teacher, how did they get that way? Oh, we, we're not allowed to discuss that. You don't have to get into origins to teach science. It's unnecessary. Okay, kid, here's the different rocks. You know, Learn the names of all these minerals. Learn the hardness test. Uh, here's, here's geometry. Here's mathematics. Here's you can study all of the sciences without getting into the origins issue at all. No matter what you teach on origins, somebody's going to be upset. Right? If you teach God did it, the atheists are going to be upset. If you teach God didn't do it, now the Christians are going to be upset. It's a no-win situation. So the, the ideal solution is for schools to not be involved in at teaching origins at all. Just teach science, period. That would be second level question. First level is should we even have these schools? Okay, since we have them, okay, what should they do? There's an awful lot of misinformation going around saying the, the evolutionists write articles and say you can't teach creation in the public schools. Well, now just hold on a minute. Let me explain what happened, give you the history. In 1925, several states passed laws saying you cannot teach evolution. It was against the law to teach evolution. They never mentioned anything about creation. It was assumed you would teach creation. All the schools were teaching it. 1925, there was a famous trial. This would be a quiz question. When was the Scopes trial? This book is word for word, verbatim, everything that happened in the Scopes trial. Called 1925. What happened in 1925, the ACLU ran an ad in the paper all over Tennessee saying we're looking for a teacher who's willing to 
admit he taught evolution and test this new law because we think we can defeat the law. They had to advertise to find a teacher who would take who would do the case for them. A bunch of guys got together in Dayton, Tennessee at a drugstore and said, you know, we need to put Dayton on the map. Our town's a little sleepy town in the mountains of Tennessee and nobody's ever heard of us. Let's see if we can find a teacher who will, who will, who will claim he taught evolution. So they got this teacher named John Scopes, S-C-O-P-E-S. -E John Scopes uh, substituted teaching biology a couple of days while the regular biology teacher was gone. So they brought John into the drugstore and said, John, would you be willing to claim you taught evolution? He said, well, I don't know if I taught it or not. He said, I, I, I just filled in the class for the teacher who was absent for a few days. He said, well, we, we, need you to, we need you to claim you taught evolution so that we can so that we can put you on trial, so that you can be found guilty of teaching evolution, so that we can show how dumb this law is. So the ACLU staged this whole thing. Clarence Darrow, a famous uh, lawyer at the time, atheist lawyer, he came down to defend John Scopes. His real purpose was to try to make the Christians look stupid and to try to uh, make, get this law overturned. And so William Jennings Bryan came down who had been four-time, I believe four-time, vice presidential candidate, a very famous politician, a tremendous speaker, and a great Christian, and a great enemy of the evolutionists. William Jennings Bryan, B-R-Y-A-N. After, Bry after the trial was over, Bryan died a few days later, and they started a college in his honor in Dayton, Tennessee, Bryan College, a good Christian college up there in uh, Dayton, Tennessee, just north of Chattanooga, about maybe 80 miles or so. Okay. So Bryan College is named after William Jennings Bryan, the famous orator who defended the Christians in this trial. The trial lasted about 10 days in the middle of the heat, uh, extremely hot, no air conditioning in 1925, and everybody, they, you know, when you read about the trial, it's, it's an amazing uh, book to read. You can get this from Bryan College, get the book from them. This is listed in my seminar notebook uh, in the yellow page, or in the uh, blue pages, references, that you, which you have in, here in front of you. You can find it should you decide to get this book. I should find it real quickly. Page 57 or 8, I think. About schools. No. Looks like... What page? 57 covers it. Yeah, well, okay. Page 57, first column. I don't... The world famous... Why don't I see it on there? Okay. Right-hand column. 57. World's most famous court trial. Uh, good, good reading. What's happened after this trial was over? The atheist lost. The judge found the teacher guilty. The atheist tried in this trial, and the, the evolutionist tried to bring in all sorts of testimony about how evolution is true. They were going to bring in the uh, Nebraska man. Later, it was proven that the, all they found was a pig's tooth. They found one tooth and made a whole missing link out of it. The Nebraska man. And that was going to be one of their key bits of evidence to bring in Nebraska man. Early in the trial, when they had all these witnesses lined in to come in, lined up, they were lined, in, lined up to come in and teach, you know, evolution is a fact and all scientists believe in it. Uh, one of the, I believe it was William Jennings Bryan or his son, who was also there helping William Jennings Bryan, the, the Christian, said, Your Honor, whether, whether evolution is a fact doesn't matter. That's not what this trial is about. This trial is simply, did he break the law or not? And so they just, with one fell swoop, they undercut all of the work these guys had done to try to bring in evidence for evolution. And the judge said, you're right, it doesn't matter. We're not here to try whether evolution is true or not. We're here to try, did he break the law or not? And it turned out he was guilty. He was fined $100, which was the minimum fine under the law at the time. And several people volunteered to pay the fine. But that, even that fine was overturned when they, on appeal. It went to an appellate court, and there's some little technicality, and they threw the fine out. So nothing happened it remained illegal to teach evolution in many states up until 1968. In 1968, the last law banning evolution was overturned. At no time ever throughout any of this was there any question about teaching creation. It's always been fine to teach creation in the public school. There has never been a law against that. Finally, even though it was against the law to teach evolution, many states were teaching it anyway. They just it stuck it in the books. 
And the problem really was with the textbook publishers and with the teachers and school boards who are ordering these books that teach evolution. But so it was taught, even though there was, even though there were laws against it, it was still being taught, regardless of what the law said. Then, in 1981, I believe, or somewhere around there, Arkansas passed a law that said, if you teach evolution, you must teach creation. In the early 80s, I should look up the date, but it doesn't matter. It won't be on the quiz. Arkansas passed a law that says, it was called the balanced treatment. Hey, if you're going to teach our kids evolution, we demand you also teach creation. Which many people thought was very reasonable. Hey, if you're going to teach one, let's teach the other. Let's try to make everybody happy. ACLU came in and challenged that law and said, if you force teachers to teach creation, that's a violation of the First Amendment. And a judge named Overton at the Eighth Circuit Court, I believe in Little Rock, Arkansas, it was in Arkansas where it ended up, I, don't know, head, I believe it's Little Rock, Judge Overton said, uh, you cannot demand the teachers teach creation. Period. That, now, they did not say you can't teach creation. What they said is, you cannot demand that they teach creation. Big difference, right? You could still teach creation if you wanted. The, all they said was, we, this law, which forces the teachers to teach creation, is unconstitutional. And believe it or not, it probably was a reasonable decision on the part of the judge. So Louisiana wrote a law a few years later and said, same kind of thing, we want equal time. If you're going to teach evolution, you must teach creation. That, of course, was tested by the ACLU, the American Communist Lawyers Union, and it went all the way to the Supreme Court. Supreme Court said, okay, you cannot demand they teach creation. However, Supreme Court said, they can teach creation if they want. We just cannot force them to teach creation. So what's happening is an awful lot of misinformation going around out there. A lot of the uh, evolutionist groups and atheist groups are saying, see, the court said you can't teach creation. Oh, that's not what they said at all. The court said the states cannot force the teachers to teach creation. And you need to understand that difference because that is vital. You've always been allowed to teach creation in public schools. I speak in them all the time. There's never been a law against teaching creation. There's never been a law against teaching the Bible in a public school. There never has been a law. Institute for Creation Research, ICR, in California, publishes this little document every month. One comes out. They call it impact, impact articles. They're 10 cents apiece. You can get on their mailing list if you call this phone number and ask, say, put me on your mailing list. Uh, this, I believe it's free of charge. Uh, their phone, pardon me? Yeah, it's free. Their phone number is 619, yeah, 619-448-0900. And just say, put me on your mailing list, and they'll send you stuff every month. Actually, they've been doing this since 1974, these little articles they put out, at 10 cents a piece, at once a month. You can go back and get all of the back issues for about 35 bucks. And it is tremendous reading. If you want to get an awesome resource to keep you busy for months, those are great articles. This one is article number 196. I believe as of today, they're up to number 350 or something like that. So I figure $35 should get you all the back issues. Clear from 1974. This one talks about how you can teach creation science in the classroom. You may want to get some of these and uh, get, order 100 copies from them and give them out to all the teachers you know. If you have some influence on uh, teachers in your area, give them one. Teachers, most teachers are afraid to teach creation because they, they think the law says they can't do it. And they're just misinformed. You can teach creation. In 1963, when prayer was taken out of the schools, how many remember that case with Madeline Muriel Hare? They took a mandatory prayer out of our schools. That's what happened. It was mandatory prayer that was removed. Prayer wasn't removed. Only mandatory prayer. Big difference. 1963, the Supreme Court said, it certainly may be said that the Bible is worthy of study for its literary and historic qualities. Nothing we have said here indicates that such study of the Bible or of religion, when presented objectively as part of a secular program of education, may be affected consistently with the First Amendment. This is the school district of Abington Township and Shemp versus Shemp, uh, 374 U.S. Uh, 203, blah, blah, blah. 1963, Supreme Court case. They said clearly, you can teach the Bible if you want. And there's some 
ill-informed ignoramuses running around out there saying, hey, you can't teach the Bible in public schools and you can't talk about creation in public schools. I'm sorry, you are mistaken. 1980, Supreme Court ruled again in the case Stone v. Graham. They said the Bible may constitutionally be used in an appropriate study of history, civilization, ethics, comparative religion, or the like. You want to teach the Bible? Have at it. There's no law against that. 1980, the Eighth Circuit Court ruled, and they said, you can teach the Bible and have religious elements in your school as long as it advances the student's knowledge and appreciation of the role our religious heritage has played in the social, structural, and historical development of civilization. If you're a teacher in a public school, you can bring the Bible in and say, kids, okay, let's, let's, study, uh, uh, let's read this passage out of the Bible and you know, see what this did for our nation. You're studying historical documents. It's a book like any other book. You don't need to be afraid of it. I mean, I shouldn't say it's a book like any other book, but as far as the school goes, you can read the Bible. Don't let somebody tell you you can't. If they, if they tell you you can't read the Bible in a school, they're ignorant of the law. But here is what has happened. The ACLU will threaten to sue. Now, they would lose the suit, and they know it. But it doesn't matter. The threat of a lawsuit will cause the average principal to say, we can't afford a lawsuit. Teachers, quit teaching creation. So it's the principal that is stopping it. It's not the courts. It's not the law. It becomes a local policy because we got gutless principals and gutless school board members who won't stand up to the people because just because of the fear of a lawsuit, which goes back to what Jesus said, the love of money, root of all evil. In 1987, the Supreme Court ruled again. This was the Louisiana case. The Louisiana case was finally vote, uh, ruled on in 1987 by the Supreme Court. And the Supreme Court said, among other things, they said, we cannot force, they did say the Louisiana law is unconstitutional because the law demanded equal time. They said, hey, you can't force the teachers to teach creation. However, they said, teachers already possess the flexibility to present a variety of scientific theories about the origins of mankind. They are free to teach any and all facets of this subject. Teaching a variety of scientific theories about the origins of mankind might be done with the clear secular intent of enhancing the effectiveness of science instruction. All of these court cases are spelled out in your seminar notebook, which you have in front of you, in the yellow pages. Question number 11, which starts on page 74 of this current edition of the book we're using for this class. So if, if you want to show this to somebody, if somebody says you can't teach creation in school, all the laws are right here in this section on what can you do in a public school. So you can read it all. Everything I'm showing you on the screen here is right there in your book. Okay? California State Board of Education, this is also in here on page 11, said, discussions of any scientific fact, hypothesis, or theory related to origins of the universe, the earth, and of life, that is the how, are appropriate to the science curriculum. Now tell me, if you were a teacher in California and you read that, would you assume you can teach creation if you want? <laughs> Certainly you can't. Now, the teachers cannot try to force the kid to become a Baptist or a Catholic or a Buddhist, okay? They cannot use taxpayers' dollars to try to convert people to their religion, but they can certainly present, hey, kids, here's one view. They can read the Bible to them. And I get sick and tired of these people going around saying, see, the, the court said you can't teach creation in schools. Show me where the court said that, please. The court has never said that. They couldn't say that. That would be a violation of the First Amendment right there. you got the freedom of speech. The teachers do too. You don't give up your constitutional rights when you walk across the door to the classroom. Um, this book we have, we sell through our ministry, Teaching Creation Science in Public Schools, uh, by Dwayne Gish, who's uh, one, of, one of the vice presidents at Institute for Creation Research, is a great book that you can give out to teachers, $4.75 through our ministry. You might also want to get a hold of the written hours, their phone number there, and all this information is in the yellow pages of your notebook here. They are helping people start Bible classes in public schools. Many states have them, 20 or 30, I don't remember now, but you can have a Bible class as an elective in your public school. Your preacher gets, comes to become the teacher. It's really amazing the, the, the latitude we have, but very few people do it. We all sit back and say, oh, public schools are going bad. Well, get in there and do something about it. <laughs> Fix it. If you say, oh, my car's not running good, well, tune it up. You know, fix it. For heaven's sake, do something about it. 
So that, these uh, two items on this one slide are not necessarily connected to each other, but uh, the written hours will help you get a Bible class started in your public school. Perfectly fine. ACLU wants to get ever, wants to get creation out of schools. I think there's a much bigger picture of why they want it out of schools. Without going too far down this rabbit trail now, we'll get into that later on seminar part five. Um, if the creation theory is true, then there's a creator, obviously. If there's a creator, we might have rights that come from the creator. Our founding fathers said, we hold these truths to be self-evident. All men are created equal. They are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights. The rights, we have the right to life, liberty, pursuit of happiness. We have all sorts of rights, and those rights came from God. The government didn't give you that right. God gave you that right. Well, suppose you would like to have a new world order, a one world government with Hillary in charge or something, okay? If you have this idea that you want a one world government, you want everybody thinking that you have authority to give them right to life, liberty, pursuit of happiness. You don't want folks thinking they've got rights that come from God. If you get a bunch of folks together that believe their rights come from God, those people don't make good slaves. They're going to throw the tea in the harbor and rebel against the king, right? Which is what happened in 1775. So, evolution teaching is essential for communism. Communism falls apart without evolution. The founder of the ACLU, Roger Baldwin, said, communism is the goal. They're going to use lawyers and lawsuits to bring in communism. That's the ultimate plan. And I tell folks jokingly, it stands for the American Communist Lawyers Union. It's actually the American Civil Liberties Union. But it is a communist organization. Now, that does not mean all the lawyers in the ACLU are communists. Many of them probably don't even know that the foundation of their organization is the promotion of communism. Roger Baldwin said, that's the purpose, folks. We're going to try to bring in communism. And so they're using the legal system to try to intimidate schools into not teaching creation because creation is one of the biggest hindrances to communism. If there's a creator, well, then he tells us what to do. And countries like Russia, Ukraine, these you know uh, former communist countries, they're still communist, by the way. Nothing's really changed, but uh, they have to have evolution. I've heard missionaries say they were in countries like when China was taken over by the communists. The missionary said the first thing that did, the communists came in there. They didn't teach communism. They got all the kids together and began teaching evolution. First thing is evolution. And then we'll teach them about communism later. It happens in every place where a communist country is taken over, where a country is taken over by communism. They have to teach evolution first. So <clears throat> as far as what you can do in a public school, we've got several books, uh, one by the Gablers here about uh, teaching. what are they teaching our children. If you do want to get involved in textbook selection, we'll get into more of this on video number four at the end. But Mel Gabler in Longview, Texas, and his information is in the blue pages in here uh, about the schools. Their phone number is also in the back of the book right here. If you want to get, uh, by the way, area code changed. We're not fixing that in these. We need to. 903. Just make a note to have them do that. Area codes are changing all over the country, you know, after the book was printed. Uh, but the Gablers uh, have for 38 or 39 years have been researching and reading every public school textbook that is printed, or nearly all of them, and writing a critique on it, finding mistakes. So if you get on your textbook selection committee and would like to save an awful lot of time, when, you de when, you, when you're given the books to decide from, get a hold of the Gablers and say, here's our list, which one do you recommend? They've already read them all. Good Christian organization in Longview, Texas. You might also want to get this little booklet. They're dollar, uh, $3 each from the Rutherford Institute about uh, students' rights in public education. Just what does the law say? Students actually have a lot more rights than teachers do. Students can write papers about creation. They can write papers about the Bible. They can, uh, during speech class, they could give a sermon. <laughs> it's unreal the rights the students have. And the students have to use have to learn to use a magic word. If a teacher, if a student wants to write a paper about, if the teacher says, "Okay, write a paper about a controversial subject," and they say, "I'm going to write it about creation," I get calls all the time. People say, I, I need some help. I want to write a paper about this. And the teacher will say, no, you can't write about this topic. You need to learn a magic phrase. This will get by every time. You say, teacher, are you discriminating against me because of my religious belief? 
That's the magic sentence right there. Are you discriminating against me because of my religious belief? <laughs> That's all you got to say. Oh, no, we're not discriminating. Okay, well, then I'll think I'll write it on creation. Okay, go ahead. Because <laughs> they're scared stiff of that discrimination word. That's the big one, the big D word that scares them. Because there's lots of lawsuits over that. We also have a book called Students' Legal Rights on a public school campus. This one is all the more, more, more detail about the laws, which, for instance, on page 53, it explains that students have the right to be exempt from any class that is teaching something contrary to their religion. Now, think what that means. If your kids are going to the public school and you don't want them taught evolution, all you need to do is go down to the school, to the principal, or to the teacher and say, I would do it in writing, and you might want to send it certified mail, so you got proof they got a copy. Spell it out clearly. I do not want my child taught evolution. This is contrary to our religion. I do not want my students taught sex education. This is contrary to my religion, or whatever it is you don't want them taught. The school then has to give them alternative material, and they cannot count their grade off. If they do, you have grounds for a lawsuit. This is how the atheists are getting all their goals accomplished. They're suing for the dumbest things, you know. I'm not saying we ought to be sue happy, but we ought to stand up for our rights. Remember when in Acts chapter uh, 16, when Peter was beaten, they threw him in the jail, he got the Philippian jailer saved. At the end of the story, the leaders in the town said, okay, go tell those guys they can leave now. Paul said, oh, yeah, no, it wasn't Peter, it was Paul. Paul said, forget it. They beat us openly, uncondemned being Romans. You tell them to come down and apologize publicly. <laughs> we need some of the, the mozzi that Paul had. Say, let's just, hey, this, forget it. I'm not going to roll over and let you beat me. I want a public apology. And I think it's time that Christians, in, in Christian love and with, with you know, wisdom from the Lord, we need to use the legal system. They were, about to, they were tying Paul up, going to beat him one time, and he said, hey, I'm a Roman citizen. I appeal to Caesar. Scared them all half to death, didn't it? What's wrong with that? Okay, Let's stand up for what's right. And students need to know they do have the right to be exempt from classes that are teaching something contrary to their religion. In uh, Matthew chapter 18, Jesus said, Whoso shall offend one of these little ones which believe in me, it were better for him that a millstone be hanged about his neck. Any teacher that's teaching kids evolution, obviously that's going to destroy their faith in the Bible. And anyone that destroys a child's faith Better carefully read what Jesus said. You'd be better off drowned in the depth of the sea. I would hate to stand before God and say, God, I was a teacher in the school and I ruined the faith of the kids that came through my class. But that's what's going to happen Judgment Day, folks, to many people. That's going to be a fearful thing to fall into the hands of an angry God. And I think we need to warn the teachers that are teaching evolution that they're going to face God's judgment someday for this. They're not the enemy. The devil is the enemy. Shortly after this trial, the world's most famous court trial in Dayton, Tennessee, the atheists realized they didn't get the, any publicity like they wanted. So some different groups started making movies or plays. They traveled around the country putting on a play called Inherit the Wind. Has anybody ever heard of that one? That'll be a quiz question. Write that one down, Heidi. Inherit the Wind was a, quiz, was a play put on, and there are several different versions of it. And there's a movie now that's been made called Inherit the Wind. The purpose of the movie is to make the Christians look stupid. And they don't use exactly the same names, but it's very obviously based on this trial, 1925. There are lots of people who've written uh, reviews of the play showing all the inconsistencies with compared to the real trial. All you need to do is watch the movie Inherit the Wind and read the book and you'll say, well, they changed hundreds of things in there just to make the Christians look stupid. And that, that movie Inherit the Wind is playing in public schools all over America every day. And all it does is make the kids think that the atheists are smart and the Christians are dumb. And if they're showing that in your school, you ought to object because that's very biased. Okay. Let me give you just a little bit of his history of what happened. Back in America, all through its history, there was very little uh, 
evolution in the textbooks. After this trial, there began to be a little bit more after 1925. By 1950, though, there still was only two or 3,000 words about evolution in the average textbook. It didn't teach it very much. These charts here are in your seminar notebook in the chart section, which I think, believe is, uh, let's see, charts, page 45 is where they start, in, at least in this edition. I hate to put this on tape, but it's on page 45, because somebody's going to get this after we've gone through. We're on our 20th edition right now, <laughs> and no end in sight. Okay, page 48 is where it is in your, in your, your book here, okay? In 19... 57, something very important happened. The space race was on. Does anybody know who got the first satellite up and what the name of it was? Sputnik, they call it, right? In Russian, Sputnik. We always call it Sputnik over here. The Soviets launched the Sputnik. It was kind of a dud as far as satellite goes. It went up, lasted a short time, and fell back down. But the fact is, they got something into orbit before we did. So the humanists and evolutionists and communists in America decided this would be great to use as propaganda to show that Americans are behind in science because we're not teaching evolution. You follow that? So there began to be news articles and letters to the editor and see America's losing the space race because we're not teaching enough evolution. Now, what does evolution have to do with putting a satellite up? Nothing. Nothing. But they said, this shows that the Soviet science is ahead of us because Soviets have been teaching evolution for years. And we weren't teaching much. Then in 1959, another important event happened. So 1957, you need to know that for the quiz, Sputnik was launched and people used that as an excuse to say American science was inferior. 1959 was the 100-year anniversary of Darwin's book coming out. Darwin's book was published in 1859, and in a 100-year anniversary, a bunch of atheists and evolutionists got together and had a big symposium and said, you know what, we still don't have much evolution in the textbooks. This theory's been around for 100 years. We all know it's true. <laughs> this is their thinking, okay? But we're still not teaching it to the kids. So in the late 50s, there was a very concerted effort to get more evolution into the schools. And in the late 50s, as far as I can figure out, the first time in the history of America, a government grant was issued to produce textbooks. Up until that time, if you wanted to write a biology textbook, have at it. You can write any book you want, and then you try to get somebody to buy it. It was the free market system. I could write a book, somebody else could write a book, we could both send it to the school, please buy our book, and the school would decide. Or the teacher would decide, or the school board would decide, or somebody would decide which book to buy. But now the government produced textbooks, at least with government funding. It was called the BSCS series. Write that one down, you'll need that. BSCS. I'll show you some of the books here throughout the course. Uh, the BSCS series was uh, the first book that I, as far as I can figure out in my study of this, that really pushed evolution to the hilt. In 1963, there were 33,000 words about evolution in the average textbook. Just from the late 50s to the mid to the early 60s, evolution took over everything as far as the philosophy goes for our school system. Jump from two to three thousand to thirty three thousand just in a few years. Nineteen sixty two and sixty three was another uh, was a, a year that's very famous for a trial where prayer was taken out of our schools. Does anybody remember the atheist that pushed that through? Madeline, Madeline Murray O'Hare, write that down. Early sixties, Madeline Murray O'Hare. What happened? There's quite a story about that. You might want to get a book if you like studying this topic called the book is called My Life Without God. My Life Without God by William Murray. Madeline Murray O'Hare had two illegitimate children. She chose the last name for one of them from the father of the child, though it was not her husband. She never did marry him. He was an illegitimate child. His name was William Murray. William, they were in school in, I think, Brooklyn, if I recall. It's been a while since I read the book. Um, 
Madeleine Murray O'Hare had gone to the Soviet Union asking to be a Soviet citizen. She hated America. Actually, she went someplace in Europe and was writing letters begging, please let me in. I, I'm a communist. I want to be in, I want to live in a communist country. They kept writing her back saying, we don't want you. Because your work record shows you never keep a job more than six months. You get mad at the boss for something and quit. You're a troublemaker. You're lazy. We don't want you. She finally got the message and came back to America, to Brooklyn, when she realized the communists wouldn't take her. Now her son, William, I think was in ninth grade, if I recall. She takes him to school about two weeks late. I think it was mid-September when this happened. She came back. She said, well, William, I guess I've got to put you back in this you know, capitalist school here in America. She's taking him to the principal's office to sign him up for school. And a few minutes late, school had just started. And over the PA system comes the principal. Let's all stand and pray. She hit the ceiling. All 600 pounds of her. Oh, man, what's going on here? She said, do they make you pray every day here? He said, oh, yes, ma'am, we pray every day. Now, William's a ninth grader, not saved, lost as a goose. And he sees this as an excuse to cause a little trouble. And so his mom said, I'm going to sue the school for teaching, for, for making my kid pray. She went in, banged on the desk and said, I don't want my kid to pray. And the principal said, ma'am, if you'd like your son to stand in the hall, that's perfectly fine. But we pray at our school. So sure enough, she filed a lawsuit. The lower court threw it out. Said, this is stupid. They can pray if they want. She appealed it. Went to the appellate court. They threw it out. She appealed it again and lost. I believe it was on the fourth try, it went to the Supreme Court, and she won. One atheist was determined to get prayer out of schools. And in 1962 or 3, the court ruled, we cannot have mandatory prayer in schools. They never said anything about teaching creation. They never said anything about reading the Bible. They just said, we cannot have mandatory prayer in schools. So prayer was taken out of our schools. By this time, evolution is being sucked into the vacuum. And kids are being taught a humanist philosophy. On these next few pages in the notebook, and here on the screen, I'll show you some of the charts of what has happened to our culture since the early 60s. This chart from the Center for Disease Control shows sexually transmitted diseases, STDs. There are now... I think about a hundred of them available. This is for kids 10 to 14 years old. Up 385% since 1963. Divorce rates in America since 1963 have skyrocketed. Somewhere around half now of the marriages end in divorce. Well, when I was a kid, when you got married, you got married for life. You better pick slow because you're going to be stuck for a long time. <laughs> Choose carefully. You might get something you don't want, right? But now, man, divorce is no, you know, it's common. Everybody knows somebody that's divorced. I didn't know anybody that was divorced in the early 60s when I was a kid. 1963, we saw an incredible increase in violent crimes. Nearly a thousand percent increase. I remember as a kid, we never locked our house. You could go off on vacation for two weeks without locking your house. Was it that way when you were a kid growing up? I was in uh, Ukraine speaking over there, and I mentioned about when I was a kid, you never had to lock your house. And I said, what would happen over here if you didn't lock your house? And they bust out laughing all over the room. They know, man, things would be stolen. I was preaching in Costa Rica. Beautiful country. Absolutely perfect weather. Almost everybody there has a 10-foot high wall around their entire property with barbed wire on top of that. Some have fenced off the top. Not just fences on the side, they got a fence off over their house. <laughs> the preacher, when he took me there, he took me, I went, went and preached in Costa Rica at his church. On the way back, we come up to his driveway, and there's this massive wall around there. He hits a button, and a gate slides open. He drives in, pushes the button, closes the gate, hits another button to open the garage, drives in, hits a button, closes the garage door, and then gets out of his car. <laughs> Thieves all over the place. Now, America is going to become this way because we're losing the absolute standards. There's no moral. You tell a kid you shouldn't steal. Well, why not? Well, because it's not nice. 
Well, it's nice for me. I end up with the stuff. See, kids used to believe you shouldn't steal because thus saith the Lord. But what if there is no God? How do you determine right from wrong if there's no God? See, when you remove God and a moral standard, what reason do they have to not commit adultery, to not steal, to not lie, to not kill somebody? What, what is the reason? I ask people this all the time and never get an answer from the evolutionists. I'll say, okay, if evolution is true, how do you determine right from wrong? What's the basis? How do, you, how, how do you decide? Almost every country, almost every religion, has some kind of standard of this is right and this is wrong. You have to have that. What does America have now as a standard? Think about our public schools. What, what is their standard for choosing right and wrong? The standard now is majority opinion. What's everybody else think about it? Look at the politicians. When they decide how to vote on an issue, what do they do? take a poll. Who cares what the poll says? What does God say? And we've gotten away from thus saith the Lord and we've gone to what saith the majority. we got leaders running around. Let's see, which way is the wind blowing? Okay, you lead or you follow, I'll lead. <laughs> this is horrible, folks. We have to get back to a standard. When we lost our standard of thus saith the Lord, this is what happened to America. This is birth rates for unwed girls ages 10 to 14. Now, the birth rates are up 100% since 1963. The pregnancies are up 553%. That means the rest of them are being aborted, murdered. We'll get into more of that on video number uh, four about how abortion ties into this evolution philosophy. In 1963, we began to see a tremendous drop in SAT scores, scholastic aptitude testing. What happened? We, well, I think we're taking away a standard. All of the branches of science were started by people who believed in creation. They believed in God. Why look for order in the universe if there is no order in the universe? But if you believe God designed the world, then you say, wow, I wonder why he did it like that. When you find a complex machine, you say, wow, I wonder, wonder how they built that. Any inquisitive young mind, you give them a neat toy or a new something, you take it apart. How does that work anyway, you know? That's good. God gave us a wonderful universe. Man, study it. But suppose there's no God. Well, then there's no reason to look for order. So the branches of science were started by people who believed in creation. 1963, SAT scores began to drop. In 1960, 1995, they had to change the SAT test. They dumbed it down. They made the test easier so that the scores would look higher. The scores are not higher. The test is easier. What is your name, George? Uh, you pass. Come on to college. <laughs> it's not quite that bad, but it's close. Can you throw this ball through that hoop? Oh, hey, you joint. Come on to college. We need you on our team, right? Unmarried couples living together in adultery was just about unheard of in the 60s. I don't remember hearing of anybody that lived together without getting married. The census didn't even keep track of it. It was such a small number. Before 1977, it was not even kept track of. But there's been a 725% increase since 1963 in unmarried couples living together in adultery. Now, God's word has not changed. Whoremongers and adulterers, God will judge. Hebrews chapter 13. Exodus 20, God said, Thou shalt not commit adultery. These are not the ten suggestions. These are the ten commandments. This is what God said. And God gave the commandments for our good. The Bible says in Proverbs, the adulterous man will hunt for the precious life. These movie stars glorify all this adultery and you know having affairs and all this stuff. It, it just absolutely ruins everything good they've ever had. Got some close friends in adulterous relationships, just absolutely miserable. They hunt for the precious life. <laughs> Boy, they really do. Um, teen suicide rate has gone crazy. I remember as a kid, some, some of my friends, uh, some people that I knew, committed suicide. But it was very rare. Now it's very common. Again, I think it goes back to the standard, how do you determine right from wrong? 
if God is the giver of life, then, well, then God gets to decide when we take life away. But what if there is no God? Well, then we decide, don't we? If you kiss a frog, it turns to a prince. How many of you believe that? No? There's a formula we've got in here, in the, in the notebook. I should have looked up the uh, address for this. The frog turns to prince. Where is that, Heidi? Do you know? Uh, it's under fairy tales. Uh, fairy tales. I taught in school. Yeah, what page? Uh, Oh, the one about time. I remember where it is. Okay. I use this illustration on them a lot. 59? Or I think it's earlier in the book. Page 9. Okay. Yeah, about time. Okay, page 9. The universe is not millions of years old. Let's look at this little formula. Frog plus magic spell equals prince. That's obviously a fairy tale, right? But in the textbooks used in the universities of America, they teach the frog plus time equals a prince. Think about it. Aren't they? Isn't that really what it boils down to? <laughs> There's a word you got to memorize. Put this one down for a quiz question. Heidi. The word farm is the acrostic. F A R M are the first letters. For F is for fish. A is for amphibian. They say that evolved next. A M P H I Ibian, uh, amphibian. And then F A R is for reptile. And then M for mammal. That's a quick way to memorize how evolution supposedly happened. The fish evolved first, and they slowly evolved into amphibians, and they slowly evolved into reptiles, and then they slowly evolved into the mammals and the birds. This is, the, this is the way they teach it. They're still teaching that the frog turns to the prince. But now it doesn't happen quickly, it happens slowly. If I told you the magician flew through the air across the room, you'd say, well, that's a fairy tale, right? What if I said he walked slowly through the air? <laughs> it's still a fairy tale, right? Time doesn't change anything. But what, what it really boils down to is Time is the hero for evolution. Did you know back in 1770, they were teaching the earth is 70,000 years old? By 1905, they were teaching it's 2 billion years old. 1969, when they landed on the moon, they said the earth is 3.5 billion years old. Now they're saying it's 4.6 billion years old. The numbers keep getting bigger because they're realizing more problems. It just, that wouldn't work. That, that'd take too long. Uh, that, that couldn't happen. <laughs> I'm sure they're going to bump this number up. Someday they won't be saying 4.6. They'll be saying 4.7 or 5.0 or who, who knows. They keep adding time because somehow it gets lost in the human brain. Well, wow, that could be true, you know. No, I'm sorry. It's still frogs don't turn to princes. I don't care how long you give them. Okay, who remembers uh, the atheist Madeline Murray O'Hare's son's name? Oh, take a raisin. You all got it right. <laughs> William Murray. Very good. What grade was he in when they took prayer out of schools? Ninth grade. Well, the man that came here the other day, Dan, and ran the tractor leveling, uh, he lives in Mobile, worked for, for a while here. He did the landscaping for Madeline Muriel Hare, her, her atheist headquarters in Texas. He made her a special walking stick. Now, the guy's a Christian. In her cane that she used, the top unscrewed. She did not know that. He unscrewed the top and put a little tiny Bible in there. <laughs> There's Madeline Muriel Hare walking around with a Bible in her hand for years. <laughs> Never did know it. He said he only saw her smile one time, all the time he worked there. She, he helped her up out of the chair one time and gave her a big hug, only time he's ever seen her smile. If you read My Life Without God by William Murray, he gives a little of the history of his mother, Madeline Murray O'Hare. Madeline's mother was just a teenager when she got pregnant out of wedlock. 
She didn't want to have the baby, so she jumped out of the second story window trying to have a, an abortion. Landed flat on her stomach, I believe. Bam! Right on the baby. Madeline was born anyway. They said when she was born, the uh, embryonic sac around her was black. The doctor had never seen that before. She was unloved, unwanted from way before she was born. Grew up thinking, nobody loves me. And she was the leader of the atheist organization for years. Everybody needs to know somebody loves you. I don't know the details of the story, and I can't verify that it's true, but I heard uh, from reliable sources that there was a young boy in Germany that went to Sunday school. He was a very poor boy, had no shoes, raggedy clothes, and decided to go to Sunday school one day. One of the deacons met him at the door and said, Son, you can't come to God's house dressed like that. Go home and get some good clothes, and then you can come back to church. Well, of course, it broke the little boy's heart. You know, He's just trying to go to Sunday school, you know, and he doesn't have good clothes. Some deacon turned him away at the door, refused to let him come. That boy grew up and became, I believe, Adolf Eichmann, Hitler's right-hand man. You just never know who you're going to influence when they're a child. You just never know. Somebody should have reached Madeleine Murray O'Hare. Somebody should have reached Bill Clinton when he was a kid. Somebody should have. Uh, who knows how many people were passing up? How many kids right now, how many kids today in Pensacola were taught evolution? Thousands of them, right? Who's going to teach them the truth? See, this is our job. One of our jobs is to go into all the world. We don't, and a lot of Christians right there, they miss the first part of the Great Commission. Jesus didn't say, build a, build, build a big building and wait till the world comes to you. That's what most churches are doing, aren't they? Hey, we're here. Come to us. They're not going to come to you. Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. And then teach them to observe all things whatsoever I've commanded you. We need to get out. And average Christian, after they've been saved four or five years going to church, they don't have any more lost friends. How many just plain old heathen do you know? Most people, when they first get saved, they're real zealous and they're the best uh, ones to bring new converts in. But after they've been saved a few years, they don't have any lost friends anymore. We've lost contact with the world, folks. And that's tragic. I don't mean you need to have all heathen friends and hang around with the heathen all the time, but we need to have some lost friends that we're trying to influence. Who are you trying to influence for God right now? You ought to be working on somebody. You ought to have some short terms you can reach and some long term. It may take you 30 years to reach them. But they ought to know, that guy's my friend. I can go to him if I have, a tr if I have trouble. We've lost contact with the world. Um, the textbooks, though, teach that the frog slowly turns to the prince over billions and billions of years, and it just doesn't happen. I don't know how to get them to see how silly it is, but, folks, it is silly. It's, it's crazy. It doesn't happen. The textbook's magic ingredient, though, to make this change happen is billions of years. All through the books, you see phrases like billions of years ago. This is a fourth-grade textbook. Millions of years ago, blah, 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 something happened. Now, Hitler said, if you tell a lie long enough and loud enough and often enough, the people will believe it. How many times is it? By the time a student goes through 12 years of school here in the Bible Belt, Florida, how many times will he have heard the phrase millions of years ago between textbooks, TV, museum tours? You think several hundred times he's heard that? Probably several thousand times, right? Eventually, it gets into his brain and he just thinks, well, it must have happened. After all, I've heard this. Millions of times. It's propaganda. That's the way it works. I teach the students what you need to do if somebody says, millions of years ago, just simply ask them the question, were you there? They'll say, well, well, no, of course I wasn't there. See, the word science, this will be on the quiz, science comes from the word, it literally means to know. That's the simplest definition. Science means knowledge. That would be good enough or to know. A more expanded definition is knowledge gained by observation or experimentation. Now, please tell me, is it possible to know that the earth is billions of years old? Can you observe that? No. 
Can you believe that? Oh, yeah. And when I speak in public schools, I will try to teach the kids the difference between what you know and what you believe. For instance, I'll show them a textbook that says, uh, billions of years ago, and I'll sell it to the kids right there. Does the, does the guy who wrote this book, was he there? No. Does he know it's billions of years old or does he believe it's billions of years old? And they start to say, oh yeah, he believes it. He, I use the word think. Does he know or does he think? Well, he thinks it's billions of years old, doesn't he? Is there any way he can know that? Can he observe it? Can he test it? Can he demonstrate it? No. He can only believe it. And once you get the kids to see, there's a difference between knowing and believing. Believing is part of your faith, your religion. Knowing is for science. So we can know that everybody calls this the deltoid muscle. Now, how did we get that muscle? Oh, now that's what you believe of how it came to be. And people often take the facts and then add their beliefs to the facts and think the two go together. I tell people, hey, beer is sold at football games. Beer has nothing to do with football. And just because evolution is stuck into the book does not mean it has anything to do with science. They're not connected. Beer does not become athletic by association. And evolution does not become scientific by association with science. It is often associated with science, and I'm sorry about that. I'm trying to get it out. But it's not science. Most Americans believe God created the world in the last 10,000 years. These polls are in your book here. I don't remember exactly where. The, uh, we can find that later, but or you can get the data right here off my slide. Mobile Press Register did a poll back in 95. Found out that 61% of the population believes the earth was made by God in the last 10,000 years. Another 30% believe God did it, but he used evolution. So that's 91% believe God made the world. Either recently or over billions of years, but the fact is God did it. Only 4% were atheistic. Another 6% said, we don't know. Don't know or don't care or didn't answer. So if you've got 91% of the population saying, we believe God made the world. And the evolutionists are out there saying, we can't teach creation in schools because we have to teach what the majority of scientists believe. Say, wait a minute. Not what the majority of people believe. And it's not really fair to say all scientists believe in evolution. Washington Times, 1998, August 31st, had a statement saying, 55% of the U.S. natural scientists... Scientists study in the natural sciences believe in Darwinian evolution. Is that everybody? No. 55%. Slightly more than half believe in Darwinian evolution of the scientists. Those are the ones that have not been to my seminar yet. We're working on them, okay? So if somebody says, all scientists believe in evolution, I say, no, wait a minute. No, they don't. Secondly, even if they did, that still wouldn't make it right. You don't decide truth by majority opinion. The majority of scientists for years taught that the planets go around the Earth. That is called the geocentric theory. Is that true? No. Did the majority believe it? Yeah. If a bunch of people believe something, that doesn't make it true. They used to teach a big rock falls faster than a little rock. Galileo changed all that. But for 2,000 years, it had been taught big rocks fall faster than little rocks. Now, here's what I teach the kids to do. If you learn to ask the right questions, you can get people thinking. Aristotle said, a big rock falls faster than a little rock. Everybody believed it. Nobody thought to check it. They just believed it. After all, Aristotle's a smart man. He must be right. Galileo came along with a simple question. He said, if I had a 10-pound rock and a 5-pound rock and I dropped them... Which one falls faster? Everybody said, oh, the 10-pound rock. He said, okay, let me ask you a question. If I take my 10-pound rock and I break it in half, but I tie the two pieces together with a string, and I drop it, will it fall like a 5-pound rock or a 10-pound rock? A brilliant question, isn't it? Without doing any experiments, just going through the thought process, he said, what if I broke it into ten pieces, each weighing one pound? But I tie the pieces together with a string and drop it. 
how will it fall? Wow, that's a good question. He said, fellas, I think we've been teaching something for 2,000 years. It's not true. And we need to learn to do like Galileo did to get people to question what you believe. I ask the evolutionists in debates all the time, would you please answer this question for me very simply? I don't want you to give me a bunch of big fancy words. I just want you to explain it so everybody here can understand it. Do you believe man evolved from a rock? Just give me a yes or no. I was in a debate one time and this atheist, I asked that question, boy, he beat around the bush for 15 minutes. After he got all done, you know, going through all this big 15 minute spiel, I said, okay, thank you for the lecture. Now, would you please answer my question? Do you believe man came from a rock? He went off on another big spiel, you know, I said, okay, thank you, thank you for all those big words. You dazzled everybody now with your vocabulary. Now, please answer the question. I just want a yes or no. Do you believe we came from a rock? Finally, he said, yes, I do. <laughs> the crowd went wild. <laughs> Well, that's stupid. But see, they don't want it to be quite so simple. One of the most effective things you can do, I think, that works so good for me when I'm on airplanes or talking to anybody about creation, evolution, if I'm on an airplane, I take a napkin and I draw these two lines right here. And I put four points on each line. Creation, flood, Jesus, today. Big bang, earth forming, life starting, today. Somehow, when they talk about it, and they say, well, billions of years ago this happened, if you're only talking about it, it gets lost in the brain. But when you can see it in front of you on a line, all of a sudden it's like, wow, that is kind of dumb, isn't it? This forces them to visualize what they've been teaching. Just simply draw on a line and say, now, do you believe the earth formed 4.6 billion years ago? Yes. And do you believe life evolved out of the rocks? This finally now they got to think about it. <laughs> yeah, I guess I do, don't I? And you believe this first life form found somebody to marry? Who was that? <laughs> and then slowly evolved into everything today. I mean, is this what you believe right here? And that is what they believe, but they don't like it visualized. And just a simple timeline, and these are also in the seminar notebook uh, for you to use here. Okay, we just hurry. We got a few more minutes. In 1799, George Washington was bled to death by his doctors because the doctors believed that if you're sick, your blood is bad. Take out your blood, you get better. Is that how you get better? Uh, no. <laughs> that was taught until the, just before the Civil War. They were still bleeding people to help them get better. That was called the Doctrine of Humors. Write that one down. That would be a good one to have maybe as a quiz question. The Doctrine of Humors. Heidi, write that one down. That was taught up until, I believe, 1860. If you're sick, your blood's bad. Take out some blood. You should recover. <laughs> the Bible says right there, Gen uh, Leviticus 1711. Write that one down. Leviticus 1711. The life of the flesh is in the blood. That was right beside George when they killed him. Right next to him on the table. Leviticus 1711. How do you tell the age of the earth anyway? Next week we'll go into how do you determine the age of the earth? What does the Bible say about it? What scientific evidence do we have? And it, we're going to go through slowly the different ways to show the earth simply cannot be billions of years old. We'll start lesson four talking about that, the age of the earth. It just can't be billions of years old. Now, here's the problem. Some people need billions of years to make their theory look reasonable. If I told you, you kiss a frog, he turns to a prince, it does not look reasonable, does it? But if you let the frog sit for billions of years, it'll turn to a prince. Somehow, the brain can accept that. They are hiding behind a cloud of time. I ask evolutionists all the time, how can this happen? How can a fish change to an amphibian? Their answer is always, given enough time, That's how their answer always starts. Well, give it enough time. <laughs> Stop right there. Time is your enemy. Time makes things fall apart. They decay. They disintegrate. They get worse. Show me anything that improves with time. If you did nothing to your house for 25 years, would it improve? No. I was over in uh, Romania. I don't think they've done anything to the highways in 25 years. 
<laughs> they don't improve, folks. Trust me. You drive like this down the straight streets because you're dodging all the potholes. <laughs> Things don't improve with time. Things get worse. And we're going to talk about, because I think the key issue that Christians need to hit on is how old is the earth? we got some Christians going around teaching it's billions of years old. And folks, it just can't be. We'll cover that next week.